at the end of the day, there's so many people that already have the freedom that they want. They're just looking at it through a wrong frame of reference. And so for me, freedom fighting is really just helping people kind of reframe. What is it that you actually really want in life? Because until we get clear on that, which is kind of what, you know, Cameron was just challenging me on until we get really clear on what it is that we actually want. Sometimes we're chasing things that, you know, you might end up with this 10 year dream or 20 years, or some people spend 60 or 70 years of their life chasing things. Welcome back, everyone, to the Kingdom Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Ellis Hamm, my co-host, Cameron Roy. Cameron, what's up, brother? Hello, hello. Glad to be here, brother. Guys, today we have an incredible guest on. Mr. Joe Rogan is in the house. Uh, <laughs> he is with us live and in person. I'm just kidding. We don't have Joe Rogan. But, dude, I was just thinking, like, you must be his doppelganger when you put the headphones on, man, like, in the background and stuff. I'm, I'm sure you've been told that. I have never been told that, but I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron, wrong or right, bro? Is this is like the Joe? We got Joe Rogan on the show today. <laughs> Man, I don't know how, how my if my answer would be interpreted as offensive or not. So I'm just going to plead the fifth on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, guys, we do not have Joe. We have better than Joe Rogan. This is a man of God right here. He is a real estate investor, uh, freedom fighter, as he says, a speaker, a podcaster, an entrepreneur, uh, co-founder of Four Peaks Capital Partners, 22 years in, in the real estate industry, sold a, a construction company that he built to more than 100 employees, sold it more than 12 million bucks. That's a lot of money. Uh, Mike Ayala, everybody, great to have you on, man. Man, I'm excited to be here. It's going to be fun. Uh, dude, so seriously, like I've been telling you, you know, we've, we've got to connect a couple of different retreats that we've been on, but man, I, I, what I really want to know, dude, is like, who is Mike? Like, who, what's your story, right? How'd you get into this? Because I know you're an accomplished real estate investor. Like you've done some amazing things. You've been in the mobile home park space. You built a construction company. So I'm just really, I'm excited to even hear like, what is a freedom fighter, man? So I really want to know who Mike is and kind of get into that today. Uh, but bro, before we get in, because I know we won't stop as soon as we start, I just want to pray for us and then let's let's roll. Uh, Father in heaven, I, I lift this time up to you today. I thank you for Mike. I thank you for uh, just uh, the Holy Spirit that is upon him. I know him to be a man of God, a, a, a powerful man, Lord, that connects with you, that uh, really seeks out your wisdom and seeks out your Holy Spirit. And so just pray for our conversation today that you would speak to us and really be with us and be present. And for all those who are listening, God, that you would use this episode to encourage other kingdom minded leaders uh, in their growth as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, as a man or woman of faith, uh, that we might see more of Christ and fall more in love uh, with him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's the so, first time, first time ever. I love it. First time. Yeah. You know, we get that a couple of times, man. I'm like, bro, we got kingdom in the name. Like, how, how could we not pray? <laughs> I love it. Uh, you think Joe Rogan would pray with us if we? Yeah. If we <laughs> <laughs> if I, think he has to. I think he has to. So you really sold your company for twelve million bucks? It was a twelve million valuation. I had a partner, so yeah, I didn't get the whole. I didn't get the whole thing. Wow! How old were you when you? I was uh, thirty-four. That's incredible. What what did what do you do at thirty-four with a couple million bucks? You know, I've often said it was the best and worst day of my life. And it really kind of shaped, you know, you're talking about the freedom fighter thing and it really kind of shaped like, I'm still on this journey, but it kind of shaped the next like really 10 years, I'll say, because which brings us up to now. Um, there's really an inter interesting story to how that all came about, but best and worst day of my life because, you know, I'm 34 years old and I've achieved, um, and I'll do air quotations, like the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, I still get a multiple, multiple six figure, you know, payment every year from that exit. It wasn't a, you know, a straight buyout, dude. I realized like retirement, isn't the thing like everybody's chasing this, you know, I want to retire by the time I'm 30. I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm no, man, we got to find our passion. We got to find our purpose. And, and I went lost for a little bit because I wasn't prepared for an exit. And I, I thought when you sold a business, you were done, but man, that's just another season. You're just opening up a new door. And I wasn't prepared for that. Nobody prepared me for that. Nobody taught me that. And so um, that's probably a whole other conversation, but crazy time. I am curious, like, how do you, was it, I mean, yeah, you sell that. Do you kind of instantly say, okay, what's like, are you asking what's next? I, I, I mean, walk us through that. Cause then I want to know how you started getting into kind of the world of like cash flow investing, right. And starting to acquire portfolios. So how, 
I mean, <laughs> yeah. what did you do? Did, did you like, I mean, give me an example though. Like when you sell your company for that much, like, do you go on a nice trip? Like, did you take your wife somewhere? Like, what did you actually do at first? And then ultimately, what did you do? I, I remember going to dinner with some friends that night and one, one couple, this guy's name was Bo. He mentioned, he said, Hey, Brad, like Mike's done. Like he checked out today. He exited and Brad was like, what you SOB call, you know, he's like, um, he's like, you're done. And I'm like, yeah, I'm done, man. And, and he's like, what are you going to do now? And I was like, I have no idea. Like, mm -hmm. and so honestly, it was like, not, a, it wasn't a dark time, but it was like a time of soul searching. And I don't know if you guys know Seth Mosley, he's a, a Grammy writer, wrote a ton of like the, he's got Grammys for a bunch of Christian songs, but you know, he was speaking probably six or eight months later. And he, he made this comment. He was talking about the children of Israel and and how they were in the wilderness for 40 years, just trying to find their way. And, and he made this comment, like, you know, we grow weary in the waiting season. And he said, we really got to be, we got to be really, really careful in the waiting seasons because, you know, we're not, we're not meant to wait. We're, we're supposed to be, you know, driving. And um, one of my favorite books is by Rabbi Daniel Lapp and um, thou shalt prosper. And he talks about how, you know, the minute in, in the old like cultures, when, when people stopped providing value to the community is when they started dying, when they became a burden, there's some, you know, cultures like the Eskimo cultures, where when somebody could no longer pull their weight, they literally just walk out into the tundra and die. And because you know, now they're a burden on, they're a burden on. The, the <laughs> brutal. I know it's horrible, but when you're no longer giving back, it's like this horrible place. So when Seth said that, you know, we grow weary in the waiting season, I was like in this time of turmoil and I even bought back a previous business that I had sold. It was like a kitchen and bath remodeling company. And I remember asking Kara, I'm like, what do you think about this? Cause when I say bought back, I took it back. Cause the guy that I sold it to was struggling. And um, I said, what do you think about this? And she's like, I don't think it's a good idea, but do whatever you want. I was just bored. And then yeah. I ended up like just wasting time. And so, um, yeah, it was a journey, man. But I, so I had started buying real estate before my exit just to kind of, but when the day that I sold the business, I had 45 single family properties, Karen, and I had um, five mobile home parks and we had three commercial buildings. And that was all bought just at the advice of some consultants. You know, we were spinning off capital or yeah, we were spinning off a bunch of capital, making money and and paying a ton in taxes. And so we just started buying real estate like ourselves. So I had a bunch of real estate. Um, <laughs> I even fired my property. I didn't fire her. I laid off my property manager and I was so bored. I'm like, I'm just going to do my own property management. That was faster. <laughs> so, you know, you're just, you're bored. And, and really, like Seth said, we grow weary in the waiting season. I should have just been, I should have just waited on God. Mm -hmm. I should have just waited on what was next, but we're not very good at waiting. And that's like, I've shared this so many times because we think that that day that we retire or exit or have a big exit or whatever, I've talked to a lot of people that have exited businesses with a lot more money than me. And they all have the same problem. Like what's next? Nobody prepares us for this. And so um, there's a lot to probably- too, Mike, right? Because like, if that's your purpose or it seems to be like, Hey, this is what I'm kind of my time, my day is built around and you don't have that anymore. It, it is, it is kind of like, it sounds a little sobering to be like, wow, did I, was I, did I really have much of a, like, what was my purpose? If, if that's gone, I don't have anything else to do. Right. Like it's, it's even kind of reflective for me. Like, well, what if I wasn't actually the founder? Like, what if we weren't running a company right now? Would I still know what to do next? Right. I think, I don't know what you think about that, but like, if you would say you, your purpose just wasn't big enough or, or it changes, I just, I guess I'd love to kind of hear your, your thoughts on that because you've exited, you know, other people. Well, you know, I think like what you guys are doing with Kingdom REI and building, you know, our brand and and I think we have to start to realize that it's it's about something bigger than us, right? And so I've built a company, I'm I'm building a company called Velocity Venture Partners, which will always be my, you know, overarching capital company, if you will. And I I actually woke up in 2018 and I'm fast forwarding here, but I woke up in 2018 and we had gone on and bought at that point in time probably 25 mobile home park communities in a fund. Um, or syndications. And and I started realizing like, there's a day coming where I'm going to exit again. And, you know, so for the first 10 years of my life, I was Mike, the plumber, Mike, the construction guy. And then the next 10 years, I'm Mike, the mobile home park guy. And I started realizing that like, my identity is not in the product that I'm like building or, you know, whether it's a construction company or a real estate fund or whatever, my identity is something completely different. And so I started thinking about personal branding and hopefully this is valuable to your audience. Like we need to have a identity and a brand outside of the product or the business that we're building. 
uh, whatever it is, because if we're lucky and if we're fortunate, we're not going to spend 60 years of our life, you know, grinding for the same thing. We're going to have these wins. Yeah, we want base hits, but yeah, I want some home runs too. And and every time we have a home run and exit, like the more we have our personal identity, our personal brands and like an overarching equity company, if you will, the more we're going to be able to shift into the next thing, whatever the next thing is. Mm -hmm. It's funny yeah. you talk about, uh, you know, kind of just getting bored and not know what to do with all this time on your hands and wanting to maybe control and not wait on God. I'm My church, we're reading through um, the Old Testament right now together and we're chapter 31 of uh, Genesis, man. And it is just rife with people understanding clearly as much as God allows them what's going to be happening, which is what his intention are, is, and them trying to manipulate circumstances to speed up that product, you know, children to come, lands to possess. And they just make a mess out of everything by just saying, your will be done my time be done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah, man. We just ruin things like that. So I know I kind of jumped in there to that question you were, you were talking about how you got in, but that's really interesting. I think, I think that is really helpful. I mean, I know there's, there's an identity in the, in the term of kind of faith or spirituality or our, our identity in Christ. But I think what you're referring to for clarity is like this brand identity to kind of say, Hey, I, I am not just Ellis, the founder of Kingdom Art Mastermind, or Ellis, the founder of Symphony Capital Group, like the importance even early on, maybe as you look back in your career to say, don't so much tag yourself to this one thing, but grow beyond that. I guess, I guess my question back to you, Mike, though, is early on, you know, for folks hearing that, and maybe they say they just have one company right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, they just do one thing. It can be tough to kind of build that overarching brand or identity, though, without tying it to something or a niche, right? Or a product or a type of people. So I guess as you look back, like what would you have done differently? Um, or what are you doing now that, you know, that is that you, that, you know, you could speak to that. You know, I think it's a values conversation. We spend so much time talking about, you know, our values and our business or whatever. So if I went backwards and I knew then what I know now, that first company started out as a plumbing and HVAC company, but then we got a general contractor's license and ended up being, you know, just kind of like a full service firm. Primarily, we want to talk about what we do. So even today, you know, we raise capital, we buy mobile home parks, I buy businesses. Those are, that's like my business. And so it's fine to talk about that. But I think just like with you know, if you hired a Instagram consultant and said, Hey, I want to build an Instagram following, they'd say, what's your pillars? Like, what are the values that you're going to, they say pillars, but really it's values. And so, you know, my values are family. Um, yes. Business, uh, freedom, wealth, you know, all these things that whatever, whatever the audience's values are. And so while you're talking about your core business, which at that point in time would have been, you know, plumbing and, uh, you know, we're the way we do customer service, I would integrate, a portion of that into whether it's my podcast or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. But then I would continue to talk about some of my other values. I would integrate some of my, Hey, look, while I'm build, building this business, here's the thing that most of you don't understand. You know, that company got to over a hundred employees. We were on the Inc fastest growing companies in America in 2009, but I kept my family first. My kids have seen the world. You know, I didn't miss football games. I didn't miss dance competitions. We traveled everywhere. And so I would integrate that in the conversation, building like who Mike is as an individual. So yes, we can talk about our business. Yes, we can talk about, you know, what is the business plumb line growth, you know, building why we do customer service the way we do the importance of the, you know, five things in business sales, marketing, accounting, but you're positioning yourself as a, you know, successful business owner who cares about his family. You know, I'm fully a believer that you can have a successful business as big as you want it or as little as you want it and still keep your family first. So I would just start integrating, like, how do you build what Mike stands for while talking about and growing your business? That's really good. I love that. Like you're, you're still, you're tell, like the, the company or the product is just part of the narrative. It's not, it's not the narrative. And I think it also makes you really interesting too, is like a, you know, as an influencer, right? and, and I know this is not a podcast around, <laughs> uh, uh, building a brand or influence, but dude, that's pretty important in today's world of raising capital and building businesses is like, you know, attention is the new currency. Uh, and, and that's, that's really, really key. Did you, uh, I'm, I'm curious too, just thinking like, um, so when I quit, before I quit my W2, um, I, I was really, the CEO of the company was a mentor of mine and still is. And he said, before you leave, you have to develop your life's purpose, mm. um, before I let you leave. 
he said, I can help you find another job and I can get you some meetings. And he's just so great. And I still meet, see him often, but he's like, you got to develop your life's purpose. And it's got to be able to transcend new jobs, new life stages and seasons. It's got to be able to go with you wherever you find yourself. And for me, it was like, well, Cameron Roy, the purpose of my life is to help people reach their greatest potential. Mm. That's it. I can do that wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing. And so I'm curious, did like, what is that for you? I mean, you talked about the process, but you know, what is it? Where did you land? Where are we landing? <laughs> um, you know, yeah. that, that's the thing. It's like, it's a constant iteration. And I've been working with a coach for the last two years to really kind of like try and, you know, hone that in and, you know, fine tune that really, because I go back and forth between like, what is it that I want to do? Like I said, Karen, and I run this couples mastermind that I think is, is probably my favorite thing in the world. That's awesome. Um, I've said this so many times, like if somebody put a gun to my head and only let me do one thing, I would probably do that. Also, like I feel called, you know, like one of the things that I'm going to really work on the next probably five years, we're kind of exiting um, the mobile home park space over the next few years. And I want to go back to buying service companies, but I get torn between, you know, that, that purpose and, and feeling, you know, a bigger calling towards something huge, like building a billion dollar organization. And, and do I actually want to put down that time and energy and effort that I know it's going to take and, or would I rather just go run a couple's mastermind? Cause that sounds like really awesome. And so, you know, but we need money, we need resources. Like God could provide everything. I know that, but I feel called to do both. And what I've kind of landed on is like, I'm really good at building businesses. And, and, you know, within that, like if we can impact a thousand employees and make their lives better and, and, you know, figure out. So I'm not directly answering your question because I don't really know what my life's purpose is because I don't think Sometimes in my mind, it can't be as simple as like, you know, you're just going to build businesses and build a, amazing relationships with your employees along. I have some key employees that have been with me for, you know, 10, 13 years, um, some of them, and and they just keep coming back. So, you know, when we exited, they left. And and I, when I make a phone call, like literally three of them are like, what are we doing next? Like when their phone rings, they just join me. And so I don't, this is going to sound maybe oversimplified, but I just put a podcast out about this last week. And for me, it's REM relationships, experiences, and memories. Like it's that simple for me. I just want to have fun, man. Sounds <laughs> to me, I got it for you. Ready? You, uh, you are cultivating places and spaces for people to flourish. Boom. Perfect. That's my life's purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it, man. You're helping people in the marriage, growing businesses to infect people's lives. That's awesome. Mike, what's a freedom fighter? Well, that's a coin that my marketing guy termed for me. <laughs> so when, when I think of freedom though, by the way, I don't think it's just financial freedom. Cause I don't, again, you know, that's not at the end of the day, there's so many people that already have the freedom that they want. They're just looking at it through a wrong frame of reference. And so for me, freedom fighting is really just helping people kind of reframe. What is it that you actually really want in life? Because until we get clear on that, which is kind of what you know, Cameron was just challenging me on until we get really clear on what it is that we actually want. Sometimes we're chasing things that, you know, you might end up with this 10 year dream or 20 years, or some people spend 60 or 70 years of their life chasing things. Mm -hmm. And then they wake up to realize like they spent the best years of their life. One of my favorite books right now is called die with zero, you know, and this guy just talks about having fun along the way. And, and so freedom fighting for me is honestly just, you know, helping people to just come alongside and have an awakening about like, really, what is it that you're actually chasing? Because a lot of times you don't need a lot more money. You just need to reframe some things in your life and figure out exactly what it is that you need and how you're going to get that. And a lot of times it's right in front of you. Everybody thinks that they want to retire and live their life on a beach or a yacht or whatever. I just want to rent the yacht for a week. I don't want to own it. That's good. I love that. So are you selling all your mobile home parks? I know I got like all these random questions, but it's all the things that I've heard about you that like really just I'm like so curious about what you're doing with your life that like I, if it feels like if you're listening, guys, and you're like, how, where do these questions come from? It's because like I've known Mike for a year now and I only know him through like the things that people say about him. So it's my turn to like understand what the heck all this is about. So you bought all these <laughs> mobile home parks and now you're selling all these mobile home parks? Well, we sold a bunch of them already. And some of that was because here, here, let me, let me say this first. So both times. So the first time that I exited my business was a values alignment. Um, mine and Kara's values changed and my business partner's values and mine were no longer in alignment with where I wanted to go. And that's probably a whole other um, conversation. 
Um, it was pretty miraculous the way that that all came together though. And the exit happened. Like I couldn't have made it up. God like totally orchestrated that. So fast forward. And um, when I joined up with my current business partner, his goal was to be a top 10 owner operator in the mobile home park space, um, which means probably 200 communities. So I teamed up with him um, officially in 2017. I started working in the business in 2016. We started buying a whole bunch of properties. We got up to 35 communities. In 2019, we I started feeling that we were kind of, number one, I miscalled this. I'm like, we're at the top in 2019. I'm like, we're, we're done. Like everything's frothy. And so I stopped buying. We bought 12 communities in 2019. That was the last time we bought a property. I said, look, we need to kind of table this back a little bit. Well, then COVID hit in 2020. And so it really caused us to just kind of relook at the entire business model and determine, you know, I mean, we just kind of had to regroup. I had a national construction company. So we had guys, three different crews that were traveling the communities and they'd live in the communities and remodel homes. And so I did what I had done in the first company. I built the construction team. I built the operations team, the property management side, built the acquisitions team. And Andrew was responsible for the asset management and the capital raising. And when 2020 hit, like we had to shut down our construction company because the guys are like literally spread across the country and COVID and all of the above. And so we just really started looking at like, you know, what's next. And what I kind of started really, you know, thinking about, to be honest, I got into the mobile home park space because it's a great asset class. Like we did really well in real estate. It's a great class. But what I realized was I'm not like really passionate and I started seeing this like in our quarterly EOS meetings when we'd be doing like our vision and our 10-year plan and our three-year plan. And, and I wasn't like engaged in this like 10-year mission of like providing safe, clean, affordable communities where people want to live. Like I was just doing what is natural to me. And I started realizing that I, I don't, I don't want to do this long-term. The values alignment with me and Andrew is not that he's a bad person. And it was the same in my first business. Um, it's just that we're no longer heading the same direction and we no longer want the same things. And so um, we sold some of the communities uh, to consolidate and and some of them were, we bought some portfolios and some of them were challenged properties. And so we just started, we were like, had one property in a state we didn't want to be in because it was part of a portfolio. So we really started downsizing. We have 19 communities left right now. We're focused on setting a whole bunch of homes. We're going to get them stabilized. And when I say exit, I may not sell those. We may just restructure the ownership the investors. Um, I would love to own all of them for the rest of my life. So I'm just kind of, I'm disconnected from the outcome of whether we sell them to someone else or whether we sell them to me or whether we sell them to Andrew, it doesn't really matter to me. Hmm. That's really interesting. So for you though, cause you say you're kind of in the season of like, do I just want to do this couple's mastermind or do I want to grow a billion dollar company? It sound like though you were leaning towards, I kind of want to go build a billion dollar uh, enterprise is, I mean, that's pretty, that's a pretty good place to start. I mean, why, why not there? What, what has changed for you? We don't talk about Andrew, but what has changed for you to want to go in a different direction, a different direction away from the mobile home park space or, yeah. or it, it may, maybe, maybe I'm wrong in assuming that, but yeah, I guess just with a different business or, or space. No, you know what actually happened? So, so the different business in the space is in the HVAC space. And I've got some ideas that are going to disrupt. I want to consolidate probably 50 to 60 companies. When I go back to 2011, this is in my journals in 2011. So this is like, this is something that, um, you know, I, I'm the children of Israel in the wilderness. Like I forgot, <laughs> I forgot where I was headed. So I bought a couple companies in in the early teens, so probably 2012, um, 2011 and 2012, we bought a couple of HVAC companies. I started kind of heading down this road, but then because of a values alignment, and and we could talk about what that was, um, if if you want to, because it it it's about the family and in you know our life's mission and stuff. And Kara made this comment one day about something that she wanted to have happen, and I was like, "There's no way that that's going to happen." Being partnered with my existing partner. And so we went down that road where, you know, I was able to exit from that company, but my goal was never to have an exit. My goal was to build that company into a huge company. Then we had this exit and then I kind of lost my way. And in hindsight, you know, Steve Jobs said this, it's easier to connect the dots backwards. I think I needed to go on and learn how to raise capital because that was not a tool in my tool belt. But I think God could have done that for me <laughs> in any way. It didn't need to be in the mobile home park space, but I just kind of got so distracted that, 
I just kind of took what came along and, and, and I, I think what's in me with this HVAC conglomerate is something that, you know, God put in my heart from the beginning. And Karen, I've talked a lot about this. We were kind of discussing seasons off camera, but when I started my company in 2004, there was no question in my mind what we needed to do. There was no fear around it. I didn't have any money. I didn't know anything about running businesses, always in just in time. Payroll was met. We scaled like crazy. And there was like this undeniable faith in me about like, you know, just doing the next right thing that I knew God needed me to do, wanted me to do. I had zero fear. And part of me is like, well, that was just young, you know, immature Mike. And as I've gotten, you know, older, I'm less aggressive. And that's all true too. But like, I've kind of lost that drive, if you will. And, and I feel it coming back. And so I don't think it was something that I ever really fully let go. I think it was something that I suppressed for a while because I didn't know how to do it. This is very, very often times not a real estate show, by the way. I <laughs> know we call it Kingdom Art. Yeah, we, we, we talk about so much other good stuff. With the time we have left, Mike, you know, you've seen a lot in the real estate space. I'm just kind of curious, man, on, you know, post COVID now, we interest rates going crazy. Like what, love to hear your, you know, as you're looking at deals, what, what, what do you see as good value right now? in the real estate market. And, you know, I know we're talking to a lot of the same people and looking at different stuff. And so I'm just curious on what, what you see as, as good value in, as it pertains to real estate, real estate investing uh, in 2023. I don't know how much direct advice. I, I haven't looked at a real estate deal for, for two years. Hmm. Uh, so <laughs> I might be on the wrong show. <laughs> um, this is the show about HVAC today, guys. Welcome to the Kingdom of HVAC. <laughs> well, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you another reason why. So currently, with our 19 mobile home park communities, our our model was to buy distressed properties and value add. And the way that we value add through in the mobile home park space is, you know, new inventory and remodels. Well, when when COVID hit and I shut down the construction company. We ended up with a backlog. I have 125 remodels right now that we're rebuilding right now and figuring out how to, you know, get those remodeled. And we have about 600 homes to set. So I don't, I'm in the fortunate um, or maybe unfortunate position, depending on how you look at it. I'm in the position of we're building right now. We're, we're focusing on our execution versus our um, buying. So I haven't really looked at deals, but if I was going to be looking at deals, honestly, like. I'm such a fan of real estate long-term that I think the thing we have to be careful with in seasons like we're in right now, nobody knows what's going on the next 12, 24, 36 months. But what I'm confident of long-term is if we can buy deals that cash flow during that time and they're not you know, overly dependent on the current interest rate or any of that, and we can get through the unknown season, which I actually think is, I'm kind of an optimist in my course, so I have to be a little bit careful with that. But if we can get through the next one, two, three years with the deals that you're buying and you can figure out how to cash flow those, I think you're going to be absolutely fine. Because the thing that I'm fully convinced of is they're not making any more affordable housing, you know, so whether it's apartments or whether it's mobile home parks or whether it's single families. And when you look at, you know, what I think of from a macro perspective too, you know, I've got these different voices in my life. And like the Bible says, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And I want to hear all the different voices, but like one of my greatest mentors in the world has been talking about how Blackstone or BlackRock or whichever one is going to offload all their inventory. But then I see them launching a $64 billion fund to go buy single family properties. And I'm like, what, like, what do they know that, that, that we don't know? I don't think they're getting ready to offload their properties when they're getting ready to go buy $64 billion worth of properties. So whether they're waiting for a distressed opportunity or whether they're just saying, hey, we're always going to be buying real estate. I'm kind of like an always be buying real estate guy. If, if again, I'm not analyzing deals right now, but I'm an always be buying real estate guy. And I think what we just need to be careful with right now is just making sure that you can cash flow anything you buy um, with some pressures on rents and with some pressures on interest rates. I think that's just, and again, don't grow weary in the waiting season because one of the reasons why we kind of slowed down in 2019, I had built this acquisition machine and I don't want to be in a place where I have to deploy capital and I have to buy deals. And if you're in that scenario, you need to be really careful right now because I don't want to be in a situation where I have to buy deals when the deals are getting harder to be bought. So I know it sounds simple, but man, just always come back to the fundamentals. I'm not that smart. I just keep it simple. Yeah. I think that's really smart because I mean, it comes down to cash flow. Don't and we've seen right in the in just the past eight months how much of this value was propped up by financing. And when your financing goes out the window because it's all based on floating interest rates, how much trouble that can have. So 
I think that's great advice. Cameron, what, what else you got, man, before we get out of here today? Yeah, real, all great stuff. And I just, I'm going to, I'm going to pick your brain on something you said earlier. You and your wife love to help married couples. And you talked about, you know, family first. And, you know, I just want to ask like personally, and I love heating wisdom from people who've been there and done that people with an experience, not just an opinion, like, and maybe even this is good for you, Ellis, too. I don't know. But I find myself often as more business opportunities avail themselves to me and more um, awesome things I want to be a part of are knocking at my door. Um, feeling the tension, I guess, of business and family, the office and the home. Like, you know, what would you say to me or someone like that who who may just have this mindset or this intuition of like, the business is uh, always on call, you know, and everything else can be put on hold. Unfortunately, you know, it sounds, it just sounds to me like you have an experience with something like that. There's a, there's a book that I read early on um, by Chet Holmes called pig headed discipline. And I think it applies to anything. You know, I think we kind of just have to shift the frame of reference around it. And, you know, just like we say, Hey, we're not going to buy a property. If it doesn't cash flow. we say, Hey, look, we're not going to take on more if it doesn't bring enough additional revenue or whatever to where we can hire more people, put more systems and processes in place. And this is going to sound crazy and nobody's going to relate to it but me. But in the early days of my career, I had to focus on what I was really good at because I wasn't very good at very many things. I was literally a plumber. I didn't go to business school. I didn't go to college. I didn't know anything about accounting. I didn't know sales. I didn't know marketing. I had to surround myself constantly with people that were smarter than me and just do exactly what they told me to do. And so that's the benefit or the unfair advantage that I had is like, I was, I was thrust into, you know, all of this stuff. And I realized that, you know, from, from a kid that started a company at 24, literally in July of 2004, 24 years old, by the end of that year, we had like 17 employees and we were doing over a million in revenue to fast forward like five years. And, and I've, you know, we're the fastest growing companies in America and I've got hundred employees and we had like 25% market share in my community. The only way I was able to do that is stay like pig headed discipline on there's only a few things that Mike's really good at. And those are the high level relationships. And it's keeping those relationships with clients, our key employees and our vendors. I've kind of broke it down into a four part quadrant, vendors, employees, customers, and then the shareholders, which were us owners, investors, whatever. So there's only a few things that you can be really great at and man, if we're going to take on more work or whatever, then you have to figure out how to make it profitable enough to bring on more people or shut the phone off, or it's just pig headed discipline. Because at the end of the day, I can tell you, my kids are, like I said, 22, 20 and 19, and they love us. And, you know, two of them have their own businesses already. They're doing great. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. So just, you have to fight that. Like you have to fight that with everything. Don't take on more than what you can handle. We, uh, Ellis and I interviewed a guy a few weeks ago and he seemed to be what Ellis coined a master delegator. Uh, and it seems like that's the sentiment you're giving right now. So appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right on too. And, and it's more in delegation too. I think Mike's point is like if the guys who have multiple, you know, owners or part owners in multiple companies, and I'm sure we all know guys like that. They're, they're not working in all of those companies. They're, they're kind of doing the same thing <laughs> for all of those companies, right? Which is kind of their one skill or, so it's like, I think you kind of elevate to, to Mike's point, like beyond the, um, you know, if you're good at sales and that's what you do for making money, well, there's only so much time to be on sales calls, right? But as you elevate your skill to coach sales or to consult with sales, like that, that's a more scalable thing that you can do across multiple companies. And so I do think even for you, Cameron, it's like, realizing what is that value that I can deliver to these companies who want me to come and be a part of them that maybe doesn't necessarily take my time at each one. And mm. that guy that you were talking about, I've seen that in him, right? He's a visionary. What he brings to companies is just creativity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he just makes stuff up. I'm like, that's, you know, he gets paid lots of money just to like <laughs> bring crazy stuff. You know, it's like, it's a skill. A lot of people can't do. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, no, uh, I've, said, I've said for a long time, like, and people are always like, yeah, whatever. But like, I'm kind of lazy. I don't, I don't, I don't really want to work that hard. And um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm kind of entering a different season now, but like I was, I, I refused to work. The whole reason why we started our business is because I was working 110 hours a week. I was out of town and I was showing up the exact opposite of everything that Karen and I had planned. And so, you know, there's some, there's some discipline around that.
Mike, what would you leave the kingdom real estate investing community with, man, before we, before we get out of here? You know, I think it's the, the success, the business, the money, you know, all of that, all of that's going to come. There's just kind of a thread that we've been talking about here. Like, I mean, if you keep the, not to get cliche, but if you keep the one thing, the one thing, whatever that is, I mean, your relationship with God, your relationship with your wife, your, your family, like what else is there? I mean, and you know, we've said this so many times, you've heard it so many times, but really, if you just ask why you're doing what you're doing, it's, it's probably in your living room. And if you're spending all of your time away from your living room, then you just really have to, all of that is going to take care of itself. But when you get clear on what it really is, like all the other stuff takes care of itself. Like it, it literally, it's a weird thing that you can't, it's not tangible, but when you let go and you just keep what's important, important, like everything else works out. Love that. If you want to hear more from Mike, which I don't know why anyone wouldn't after today, uh, he has a great podcast, Investing for Freedom. Uh, that's Investing for Freedom. If you want to go to the website, investingforfreedom.co and uh, go check out Mike's podcast, his blog, and, uh, and and support him there. Mike, where else for folks can go to follow along or is that the best place? That's probably the best place. Instagram. I'm pretty active there. Uh, at the Mike Ayala. Mike Ayala. Say, say that again. Ayala. Ayala. A Y A L A. Dude, I enjoyed this, man. Really grateful we got some time to spend together and looking forward to being together in person here soon. Yeah, it's been great, man. Super fun. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah, good to meet you, Mike. Hey, if you enjoyed the show, uh, make sure you screenshot it. Let us know on social media. Instagram is a great place to go do that. And if you have not yet left us a five star review, go leave us a five star review uh, today. I'm, I'm watching you. I just went and looked last week, and no one has done that in six months, even though I say it every week. So, we need to offer a prize, bro. I'm talking to you, the people who are like, oh, I'm, I should do that, but like I'm kind of busy right now. You are the person that I'm talking to right now to go oh. leave that five star written review. We, we should come up with a prize, but yeah. But here's what, don't tell them that because then they won't go do it. So we've already oh, charged those in the foot, okay, right? my bad. But go do it and then we'll come up with another prize. If, you let, if you've if you left one in the last three months, we'll probably still give you the prize anyways. So how about that, Cameron? We would retroactively give yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, we saved it. Guys, we'll see you next week. Cheers.